We have the breaking news now that burglars broke into the home of tragic Bronson Battersby and his father just one day after their bodies were discovered. It's been reported intruders crept in via a back window and stole a wallet belonging to Kenneth Battersby and some of his medication. Just 24 hours earlier, social services and police found the bodies of two-year-old Bronson and 60-year-old Kenneth lying on the floor of their basement flat in Skegness, Lincolnshire. Joining us now is former Met detective Peter Blexley and Sun reporter Rachel Dale. Uh, let's go to Rachel first. Thanks for joining us, uh, Rachel. Uh, you have broken uh, what may be the most heartbreaking story I've ever read. Uh, congratulations on a great scoop journalistically. Uh, but it's the sort of story uh, that uh, really, really upsets everyone. Um, now, you've been in contact with the mother. You've interviewed the mother. Uh, I mean, I have to ask you this. You, you know, we know the story that there was... Su there was some kind of um, row on uh, Boxing Day. The mother stormed out with the other two kids. Um, uh, so we'll get to that in a minute, because I want to know what her story is. But uh, I gather you've spoken to the landlord, or is it the landlady of this house, since uh, the break-in. Uh, tell us what you know. Yeah, um, I've actually just been with uh, the landlady uh, of the the basement flat where Kenny and Bronson were, were both tragically found on the 9th of January. Um, she confirmed that there has been uh, a, there'd been a break in. Uh, they'd crowbarred, seems to have crowbarred the window, gained access. Um, they'd taken some prescription drugs that were um, on the side that were Kenny's. They also told me that there was a as I had the property had been empty, a dog was left. The dog was left in the kitchen, and the, the dog had ransacked the kitchen. Um, so they knew the, that it had been left in an, an awful state, and they tidied it up. But when they went back after the burglary, they noticed that there was an empty uh, box of where gravy granules will have been, which apparently had cash in it, and that was left on the side. Um, so yeah. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, well, let's get to, to uh, the, the mother's story. You know, I've got to ask you, uh, uh, I mean, I mean she, so she leaves there's some sort of dispute, some kind of row between the mum and Kenneth. Uh, she goes with the other two kids, uh, little Bronson's siblings. Uh, I mean, you know, didn't she sort of phone up to find out how Bronson was at any point? Didn't she go round? Didn't she check? Uh, what's her story? Well, it, it was actually November that she last saw Bronson um, and that she had this big, uh, big row with Kenny. She says that uh, Kenny is the kind of man that if he says no, it's no. She was giving him space. Um, you know, she had the other two children um, over the Christmas period. They went away um, and she hadn't been in contact tragically um, with with her son. Um, I mean, from speaking to her, I can tell you that there's no parent in the world that is as racked with guilt as she is right now. Um, you know, she'll never forgive herself. Um, but she believed that he was safe in a flat um, he was warm, he had food, he had a father who loved him. Um, she was also had the reassurance that he was under um, the radar of child services, children's services, um, and that they were checking in on them regularly. And, and obviously she never expected that her son would be found having died of dehydration and, and starvation. Rachel, <clears throat> how does uh, Bronson's mum feel regards the fact that the social worker had contacted the police more than once and they failed to turn up and failed to check? She's furious. Um, she wants answers. Um, you know, obviously, a, a rapid um, investigation has been launched by the council. Um, the police have also launched their own in independent probe into what's happened. Um, she, you know, she, 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 she just wants answers for them, and she also wants for this for something to be put in place to mean that, that no family and no mother ever has to go through this again and um, she can't understand why they didn't just ask for entry on the 2nd of, of January or the 4th um, and actually after speaking to the landlady uh, earlier today myself uh, she said that on the 9th as soon as she was contacted by the social services she was roused to that address in 10 minutes they she gave them the key they you know if she let them in they they didn't kick the door down it that could have happened on the 2nd and Bronson would, would probably still be here. 
And did social services uh, contact uh, the mother during all of this? They did, but she was away. Um, they spoke to her. Um, t I think there was maybe some confusion to do with, because her two other children are obviously also under um, the child services radar. So um, yeah, that they'd been around, but she, they hadn't said that they hadn't seen Bronson and that they hadn't seen Kenny. So she, she wasn't aware that that, that he was missing. And. Uh, uh... Some of the details of this are absolutely devastating. Uh, tell us uh, your uh, story here. Uh, the, there is a report that a neighbour on New Year's Eve heard a little whimpering voice crying, Daddy. I mean, you know, you just want to break into tears hearing that. And that uh, had he be, have been two inches taller, little Bronson could have reached the fridge door, which was packed with uh, Christmas leftovers. Uh, those stories are, are as, as far as you know, uh, true? Yeah, um, he was also just a few inches too short to get up to the right level on the window ledge because it, it was a basement apartment. So, you know, if he'd just been that little bit taller, maybe the social services worker would have been able to see him if he was stood at the window. Um, yeah, uh, maybe he would have been able to alert uh, somebody about it. But it, yeah, the, the cries the neighbour heard, it was uh, New Year's Eve, I believe. Um, so by by the 2nd of January, he, he could have still been alive. It would have only been 28 hours and maybe he could have been saved. Rachel, I also read that <clears throat> uh, Bronson's mum, when she had to go and identify uh, both her, her ex-husband and Bronson, she wasn't able to actually pick up Bronson and hug him. Yeah, it's just heartbreaking. Um, his body was too thin, too fragile. He'd been left, obviously, for, we think, well, possibly nine, nine days before he was found. Um, she was able to kiss him. Uh, he had a blanket covering his body. She was able to hold his hand, kiss his face. She could say that she loved him and, and gave him messages from from his two siblings who were only seven and three and obviously miss him very much. And they sent a special little present, a little Winnie the Pooh toy that was his favorite that she placed with him in the morgue. Yeah, stop telling us all this stuff, uh, Rachel. It's getting too uh, upsetting. Uh, but uh, what does the mother actually want to happen now? Uh, you know, uh, from, you know, read it, cursorily reading all the details of this story, it seems to me that the social worker did, I don't know if it's a she or a he, uh, did their best, uh, you know, kept going back to the house, rang the police, uh, the police didn't do anything, uh, and eventually the social worker took it upon themselves to get the key and go into the house. I mean, what does uh, Bronson's mum want to happen now? She she wants answers. I think it's too soon to we. She doesn't know where this. There's obviously been some huge failure here. Society, you know, this is 2024, and a two year old is, is just starved in a in a built up area in, you know, a, a place was surrounded by neighbours under the care of the children's services and, um, yeah, the social workers being there, the police have been informed like something. There's been a huge failure. And uh, I think that we really need to kind of wait for the investigations to identify what's happened. And, and she wants the some kind of guidelines put in place now so this can never happen again. So she, she's talking about maybe if social services don't make contact that first time on the second, maybe there should be some kind of, uh, you know, a, a crisis contact then that they could go to. So you don't have this crossover. Better the police system, that yeah. don't really need um, uh, yeah. But just before you go, uh, thanks so much for talking to, uh, to us, Rachel. Uh, what have you learned about Bronson? Tell us about Bronson. We're seeing all these pictures. He looks like a lovely little kid. And actually, you know, from what we're seeing, his birthday party, his little bicycle here and everything, uh, he looks like he was loved. Uh, you know, this looks like, I mean, despite the uh, row between the parents, uh, he looks like a happy kid. What have you learned about Bronson? Yeah, I mean, you know, Sarah, his mother, she says... She tried her best as a mother and, and so did Kenny. There's no doubt over the fact that he was a loving father. Um, and also Bronson adored his dad. He always wanted to be with daddy, daddy. And that's one of the reasons that obviously they decided it'd be best that Bronson did stay with him. Um, he was a happy little boy, 
rarely cried, loved pink wafers, loved Coco Melon, <laughs> like all, all just a, a happy little boy that was full of life, loved strawberries, um, yeah, bananas. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just tragic. And Rachel, what has been the reaction in the local community? How, how, how are the neighbours in the, in the local neighbourhood feeling? I think everyone's in a complete state of shock. Um, I mean, the landlady that I've spoken to this morning, she actually considered Kenny a friend. Um, you know, this is a, it's a close community. It's not a, oh, I'm a landlord and I'm keeping my distance. Like, they care. They are, they're heartbroken. Uh, everyone that I speak to, they, they just can't believe that this has happened. Um, and, yeah, this, uh, everyone has regrets of some kind, uh, it seems, that we speak to because, you know, should they have... Should they have knocked on the door more? Should they have, the, the neighbour, should they have called the police when they'd heard the last cries and they didn't hear any more noise? And it's just a, it's just a story that's littered with tragedy. Well, Rachel, uh, listen, these kind of stories, it's, uh, they're so, so devastating, but it's a really important story. Uh, and uh, it's great work that you revealed it to a shocked nation. Thank you so much. Uh, that's Rachel from The Sun. Now, Peter Blexley, uh, former Met Police detective, is with us. Now, Peter, thanks for coming in. If you um, uh, analyse the chronology of this, it does seem that, uh, you know, the social services department, who were, you know, who were keeping an eye on this household, uh, I mean, they seem to have behaved quite well. Uh, somebody's gone round, uh, knocked on the door, no answer, went back a couple of days later, no answer, went back another time uh, and then said, uh, called the police and said, look, I can't get into this, there's something going on here. And uh, the police have done nothing, nothing. Uh, they should have gone round and broken in, frankly. Uh, and what I find so unsatisfactory, I know you can't just get... Uh, the real story, you can't get an inquiry done in one second or one day. But every time you get these accusations of police misconduct, which just is serious misconduct, uh, they just go, oh, we've referred ourselves to the police watchdog. Uh, that's it. Uh, and what is the police watchdog? It is the police do it marking their own homework. It's not satisfactory, is it? Well, the Independent Office for Police Conduct will claim, as they frequently do, that they are independent. However, there are many within policing that would contest that, not, not only people outside of policing. <coughs> what now, amidst this grief, this hurt and this pain, what we need from both investigations, that being carried out into the social services and that being carried out into the, the police, mm -hmm. is impartial, independent, thorough, measured, calm investigations mm -hmm. so that exactly <clears throat> what went on can be established and when i say exactly i mean the truth of the matters can be established and then and only then will we be able to say with some degree of certainty who if anyone needs to be held to account now this independent office of police conduct investigation needs to be resolute it needs to hold off from the pressure of obeying media and upset family and friends mm. and a community. Now is the time for steady, calm, controlled heads and a leader who will understand that sometimes you need to put the kettle on, be considered and listen to other wise voices. <clears throat> Peter, I, maybe I'm just naive, but hearing about this burglary the day after the, the bodies were found, I've never heard anything like this before. Can you just tell, tell me, as, as a former officer, you've never seen anything like this before, surely? Some people are beneath contempt. Mm -hmm. Whoever that was that went into that home where such an appalling scene had been discovered is, quite frankly, subhuman. Prescription drugs were stolen, undoubtedly either to feed a habit mm -hmm. or to be sold for some form of profit. There may be questions to be asked at a later stage as to should that property have been more secure before anybody left it, but they might be questions that need to be directed <clears throat> at the owner or possibly some other body. But once again, amongst the emotion and the pain and the grief, now is the time for calm, measured, 
proper investigations to establish truth and not proof of what somebody might be thinking. But well, this seems like it was someone who knew, who knew um, Mr Battersby because if they went into the uh, empty gravy granule part where, the, where this man kept yeah, money. So yeah. that must be someone who knows. No, no thief surely is going to walk in and start emptying out food. So surely this means someone who knew him knew well, where that money was. Well, Lincolnshire police now realise that they are very much under the media gaze. Mm -hmm. And the report of this burglary today will mean that the police will launch an investigation mm -hmm. into this burglary. And what I sincerely hope is that it is thorough, prompt, professional, and that somebody at some point is held accountable and put in front of a judge, because I would imagine the contempt that will be shown for that person might mean that any sentence handed down might be a substantial one. Good. Um, but, uh, it, I mean, it's not a crime scene, this, uh, uh, this but it, it's a scene that needs to be... Uh, forensically examined, you know, what happened, uh, what did the kid do, you know, all, it needs to be looked at, but sh so it, that should have been like a crime scene. Why weren't the police protecting this place? Well, I'm sure it has been photographed, and trust me, they will be photographs you never want to see in your life. Yeah, sure. I'm sure an assessment as to whether it needed to be forensically examined or not was undertaken and decisions made. All those decisions will be logged and reviewed by the officer who has responsibility for investigating these deaths, preparing a case for the coroner. Let me remind you, if I may, that a coroner's court is the most powerful court in the land. Mm. So a thorough professional investigation into these tragic circumstances, mm. as well as the investigation into how these circumstances came to be, should all be of the highest quality. Yeah, well, we need some clarity on all of this because uh, it is an appalling saga. <clears throat> and thank you so much for coming in. Peter Blexley there, former Met detective.